Hello, everybody. My name is Robbie Luckett. I'm director of the Margaret Walker Center at Jackson State University. The Margaret Walker Center is a Black Studies Institute museum and archive dedicated to the preservation, interpretation, and dissemination of African American history and culture. Welcome tonight to this very special program featuring some really wonderful partners of ours uh, who are doing important work in terms of the state of Mississippi and our history. The Lantern Project is a multi-state, multi-institution effort to digitize the legal records of enslaved persons led by Mississippi State University Libraries and featuring records from the Mississippi State Libraries, the University of Mississippi Libraries, Delta State University Libraries, the historic Natchez Foundation, the Columbus Lounge Public Library System, and the Montgomery County, Alabama archives. Those of you who are with us tonight on Facebook and YouTube, you're gonna get a really wonderful introduction to this project and how to navigate both the project's digital collections and specific historic documents included in the project, such as probate and circuit court records. The Lantern Project has been generously funded by the National Historical Publications and Records Commission of the U.S. National Archives and Records and Administration. I think with that said, uh, the importance here of digitizing slave records in Mississippi shouldn't be lost on anybody in our audience. These have long been obscured in our historical record in this state and providing greater access to them is an incredible public service being provided by these wonderful partners. Now, joining us tonight um, from the Mississippi State University Libraries is Jennifer McGillan. And Jennifer um, is joining us, as she told me, from the basement of the Mississippi State University Libraries right now. She uh, has been the coordinator and head of manuscripts at Mississippi State University since 2015. She holds a BA in English from Davidson College, a MLIS archives from the University of Pittsburgh, and a JD from New York Law School. Her research interests include 19th century legal history and enslaved persons, the intersection of archives and disability, vintage cooking and recipes, women's work, and pirates, my favorite of all. I don't know if you know this, Jennifer, but uh, Margaret Walker grew up in New Orleans, and we have an epic poem of hers in our collection at the Margaret Walker Center that she never published about the pirate Jean Lafitte. It's nice. over, 200, over 200 pages uh, on Jean Lafitte. It's pretty remarkable. Anyways. Uh Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you for being here. We're excited about the Lantern Project and uh, an opportunity to lift up the good work of our partners. And I know that our community is very much interested in this work. And Jennifer, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening. I'm going to share my screen and we're going to dive in. All right, so I'm beginning. Okay, so uh, once again, I am Jennifer McGillan. I'm, I'm the coordinator of manuscripts at, uh, at Mississippi State, and this is the Lantern Project. So as Robbie uh, very ably summarized, um, this is, this is in, I'm just gonna uh, say here is our website, and I encourage you all to visit it. Um, but the participating institutions are Mississippi State, the University of Mississippi, Delta State, the Columbus Lounge Public Library System in Columbus, Mississippi, Historic Natchez, uh, and the Montgomery County Archives. And, uh, and again, we have been very generously funded by the National Historical Publications and Records Commission, or the NHPRC, of the United States National Archives and Records Administration. So why did we do this? Uh, so it was inspired by a similar project called Unknown No Longer at the University of Virginia, uh, rather at the Virginia Museum of History and Culture, which is now hosted by the Library of Virginia. And if you, uh, if you think you have relatives, uh, or enslaved relatives or enslaved, uh, if you're interested in the history of enslaved persons in Virginia, I strongly recommend that site. Um, but for the Lantern Project is a response to a specific ongoing need shared by all of the participants 
in the project, which was that we all respond to inquiries from patrons regarding records of enslaved persons. Uh, it's also a common desire among the partner institutions to address historic inequalities and shared access problems, uh, which included anything from under-processed collections or unprocessed collections to scribbly 19th century handwriting. And finally, it's a recognition of some historical context, and that is that when enslaved persons were sold, you know, quote, down the river, uh, it was most often our river, uh, the Mississippi, as well as other local waterways. So, and then the reason we called it the Lantern Project uh, was that uh, you see in the um, contemporary accounts of family separation, that the phrase that comes up frequently is that the, fam the family members are described as having vanished into darkness. So you just have this repeating concept of they disappear, they disappear into darkness. And so this project is, is our attempt to turn on the lights. So what's there now? Uh, participating organizations have, we have scanned hundreds of pages of documents, including receipts and bills of sale, probate files, uh, including estate inventories, estate administration records, records of sales, sales from estates, civil and criminal circuit court records, plantation records, and more. And these records are in the process of being transcribed and added to the project collection in the Mississippi State Digital Collection. So the first thing I do want to underscore is that we're not done. So if you go to the site and you're like, that's it? No, that's not it. Uh, but we've got, we have enough there uh, that we felt pretty good about starting to share it with the world and, and telling people about the documents and, and how to use them. But, uh, but to say, you know, go ahead and, and bookmark us and check back as there will be additions. So what we are hoping uh, that this project will enable the different kinds of research opportunities are, uh, first of all, genealogy research and connecting descendants of the enslaved to their ancestors. Uh, secondly, general research into the legal, financial, and social history of the practice of chattel slavery in America and the lives of enslaved persons. Uh, there's actually a lot you can learn from a probate record. Um, they're very much a snapshot of a household at a, at a specific time period. Uh, and, you know, if you get a lot of them, you can get snapshots of many households. Uh, so hoping that that kind of general research will be supported. Uh, and finally, uh, to do some medical and social history, uh, you definitely can use these records to explore topics related to medical care provided to enslaved persons, as well as the health and wellness of enslaved persons, both medical, uh, mental and physical, rather. And then, uh, because they are legal records, there are legal history research, so you can uh, look at the treatment of enslaved persons within the framework of the antebellum legal system, different areas of law uh, that we think you can um, explore would be uh, wills and trusts, obviously, first of all, and some family law. Sometimes you get references to uh, to custody agreements, mainly among the enslavers. Um, but there's uh, also property, especially the long evolution of the rights of married and unmarried women, and a variety of topics in civil and criminal law, especially related to how enslaved persons were perceived and treated by the law. So we're going to start with the probate file. So uh, what is a probate file, first of all? Uh, a probate file contains records documenting the management and disposition of the estate, the property, of a deceased person. So the kinds of documents you're going to find in probate files include estate inventories and appraisals, records of the financial administration of the estate, receipts and bills of sale for the sale of enslaved persons, uh, documents relating to medical treatment for enslaved persons and other records documenting the activities of the executor of the estate. Estate inventories and appraisals uh, were created by court order and they include all of the real and personal property. And by that we mean the land, structures, enslaved persons, livestock, furniture, and other personal property belonging to the deceased person. And the estate inventory is a document that lists the deceased person's property, including the enslaved persons, usually with an assigned value or an appraisal. So this is an example of, uh, of an appraisal and an inventory. And I'm going to use my little zoom tool and say, you can see here, uh, see right here, this is the, the this is a record of an enslaved person. So they have the name 
uh, of the enslaved person. There's two on this line, so they have the they have, they have the name and they have the assigned value, and then at the end here, you can see they have combined these values. All right. Okay. So, uh, but you can see over here, they have uh, the list of other kinds of property and. So they're all, in some cases, they're all mixed together. This one is from the appraisal and in, of inventory of property owned by Alicia Baker. That's from the Montgomery County Probate Court, but you'll find very similar records in the, in the Natchez records. All right, so other things you can find in the, in the probate file is a will or wills. Uh, some of these probate files, so like I said, they do include an original will, uh, which often has a wealth of family information uh, both for the enslavers and for the enslaved. Uh, and it will also include frequently the details of the disposition of real and personal property. So for example, a will could indicate which specific property, including enslaved persons, was to be transferred to members of the deceased person's family or to, uh, to individuals outside the family. Uh, but they didn't, sometimes they, they, they named, they listed enslaved persons by name. Other times they may have just set a percentage or a dollar amount um, for the distribution. And then you will have documents in the file that show the executor uh, kind of working it out, uh, you know, which enslaved persons were, and based on their assigned values, were, were to fit into that percentage or, or into the dollar amount that had been detailed in the will. Okay, so this is an example of a will. Uh, this one's from 1826 uh, from Robert Dunbar. This is also uh, mm -hmm. also, an, also an example of what not to do with historic documents. You can see some very well-meaning person somewhere along the line uh, noticed that there were tears in here and they, and they scotch taped it back together. And, uh, and now almost 200 years later, uh, that tape is very acidic and has uh, has caused a discoloration on the thing. So if you <laughs> if you have historic documents, please, we beg of you, do not scotch tape them back together. Uh, anyway, so he, this this is the first page of the will, and, uh, and as you can see, this man had uh, or whoever wrote this, so I believe it was Robert Dunbar. Uh, he has beautiful handwriting. Um, we don't always get that lucky, uh, but on the second page is where. Again, you can see they do list them by, um, use my little zoom tool. Uh, so you can see here that they do list them by name. And uh, if, you're, if you're reading one of these documents, if you, see, if you see to wit, that's usually the start of a list, right? So if you see to wit, they're about to list something off. Um, and in this particular will, they do have descriptors of the enslaved person. So, they have uh, this age-wise, so we have old, we have young. Uh, sometimes they will also include a, uh, sometimes they include a physical descriptor, um, but not always. Uh, here you can see uh, they do they do include a description of a family relationship, but they have they have Emmanuel mm -hmm. and his wife Hannah, uh, and then they have their four uh, four children, and then they give the children's names as well. So. This is uh, this particular will is exceptional with this amount of detail. They don't always have that much information, but okay. All right. So, uh, in some instances, such as when there was no will, once the property had been appraised or, evalu or valued, a uh, public auction was held, and then you will hopefully uh, find a list of the property sold, including the auction price and the purchaser. And the important thing to know is that the auction price can be and often is different than the appraised value. So if you have two, if you're looking at a probate file and you have two, uh, two lists, uh, you have the same names, but different numbers. It's like, what's going on here? One of them may be the appraisal uh, that was done by the executor or the appraisers. And the other one may be uh, the auction list. Uh, and that's why the numbers are different. Okay, so when you are reading an estate inventory, uh, but then as the more I do this presentation, the more I learn things. One thing I've learned is that apparently, Mississippi there was a system, and Alabama there really was not. So if you're if you're looking at the Natchez records, then uh, sometimes you know more often than not, uh, this kind of rough structure will apply. Whereas in Montgomery, they just 
did not do that. They just, they just, it's just on the list and there's no particular structure. They're different every time. Anyway, uh, what I noticed working on the records in Natchez is that there was an order and it was real estate, lander structures, followed by enslaved persons and then livestock and then personal possessions such as firearms, clothing and household goods. So in, however, uh, even if they do list the enslaved persons up front, you do always wanna read the entire document because there are instances where individual enslaved persons appear out of order in the inventory. Uh, I would start reading them just out of, out of interest and I would sort of you know, read the first couple of paragraphs and then I would keep going just to see what else was on there. And then I would maybe find another one or two enslaved persons at the end. So, um, so you do wanna read the whole thing. Uh, the information included in inventories varies, uh, but can often include the name of the enslaved person. Sometimes you will also get an age, uh, but sometimes you may also get just old or young. Uh, uh, some inventories include other details such as a physical description, if, if it's of their physical appearance or the, the shade of their skin tone, if they have, may have a reference to a special skill such as blacksmith or a tanner, uh, they may have references to medical conditions uh, or to family information, whether it's daughter of or son of or wife or husband or something like that. Um, I do want to note here that a lot of the language that they use as uh, to, to describe enslaved individuals can be very unkind uh, and that overall working with these records can be very hard. And like I said, we want to encourage research, but as someone who has worked with these records, I also want to encourage you, if you're, if you're working with them, to remember to surface every once in a while. Uh, go outside, do something that brings you joy. Do not marinate in this 24 seven. All right. Um, okay. This is an example of an estate inventory. This one is, this one is from Natchez. Uh, this one's from 1818. So what's interesting about this one is, so let's look over here. Uh, first of all, it's pre-printed. Uh, and so you can see up here, it started out writing Mississippi, Ter Mississippi Territory and they had to scratch it out and write State of Mississippi because we had just flipped over the statehood. Uh, and you can see also they had pre-printed the, uh, the names of the officials and they had to cross those out too because they were, they were different. Um, but, okay, so this is uh, an example of an inventory list. And you can see we start out with the house and the lot and the, and the land and the structures. And then actually on this one, they, they, they don't follow the structure that I know I just told you about because the, the one enslaved person is at the end. And in this case, it is in fact, it is a, a mixed race child. Uh, and it says, it says boy, and it really does mean, does mean a boy. He's about six years old. And then if you keep going over here, there is a reference to another child uh, who is about seven. And it says that uh, she is residing in a different household and they have no writing to show for it. Um, so there's potentially two ch uh, enslaved children here. Okay, All right. okay. so the estate administration records uh, these document the activities of the executor, including the bills paid on behalf of the estate and other financial transactions. So these records can include activities related to enslaved persons, such as doctor visits, clothing and shoe purchases, and food purchases. Uh, sometimes if they had, if a, an enslaved person died, you'll, you'll find a record of a, a coffin purchased. Um, the other important thing to know is that estates could be and often were, they were kept open for years after the property owner died. So estate administration records can be tremendously large. Um, and uh, the Lantern Project, uh, when we're scanning, scanning these estate records in Natchez, we were only scanning the material relating to enslaved persons. So there may be additional material in the file relating to real estate transactions and other things so if you're interested in the estate file beyond the enslaved persons, then you want to reach out to Historic Natchez and find out what else might be in that file. All right, so this is an example of an estate administration record. 
This one goes, this is for Rebecca Franklin of Natchez, about 1821 to 1825. So we're going to go up here, and you can see 1821 up there, uh, and you can see all the different, uh, different things that were included. And then you can see as we come down here, um, we're down to, that might be 1823, it could be 1823 or, or 1825. But anyway, uh, so you can see all the different kinds of activities that were occurring here. All right. All right, so exiting the probate court. Uh, other, other kinds of court records that uh, can be where enslaved, enslaved persons can be found. Uh, for example, there's this record book from Lowndes County uh, where people register the enslaved persons they brought into Mississippi. And in this particular record, uh, they don't, they do not give the names. Uh, but again, you see two wit. And so they, they list there are seven men, eight women, three boys and one girl. Uh, and they, they specify they were, they were not for the purpose of sale or hire. Um, now, again, this every, a lot of this will depend on the clerk. Uh, and so this, there's a different record that does include the names. So, uh, so in this case, we can see there was Moses, Henry, Ophelia, and Mary uh, were included in this record. Okay, so some of these record books, uh, the, the Circuit Court Record of Slaves from 1845 to 1868, also includes witnesses summoned for grand jury testimony uh, from 1857 to 1868 and after emancipation that does include freedmen and freedwomen. And you can see this F over here means freedmen or freedwoman. So uh, beyond this, enslaved persons also appeared in the records of civil and criminal courts. In the civil cases, enslaved persons were most often involved in cases where personal property or debt were at issue. And in criminal cases, enslaved persons were sometimes involved in property crimes as well as in violent crimes, such as assault or murder. Now, the enslaved persons could be involved in multiple ways in these in in these criminal cases. Sometimes um, there was there was one example uh, where two enslaved persons were uh, unnamed, unfortunately, were offered as a bribe uh, to somebody to to commit a crime, and this was mentioned in the court case. And there's often other examples where the enslaved person is accused of crime. Uh, Okay, so this is an example of where an enslaved person was levied, was levied against a debt. Uh, and so the, the Pitchlands and, the Garland and, Gar and Samuel Garland sued William Moore for, uh, for not paying his promissory note. And, uh, and, and Moore had one enslaved man who, uh, as best we, best we can determine, his name was, was Dertoni. Uh, who was levied against the debt, that was in 1837. And then this one, uh, this is another, other types in 1856, this was Catherine Atkins, uh, and she was suing for involuntary servitude. So this was an, a case where a free woman of color had been somehow, we actually don't know how, uh, had been transported from Maryland to Lowndes County and was uh, asserting her claim for freedom. And so if you're wondering, but how does it end? Uh, majority of the cases do include a book and a page number somewhere within the, within the, uh, within the case file. And this refers to the record book ledgers uh, where they did record the major points of the case, including the outcome. And that is included in the metadata. So if you want, if you need to know how it ends, uh, you can contact the Columbus Lions Public Library System and, uh, and Ronald Van Sully can tell you, hopefully. Uh, so in, as, for, as for Ms. Atkins, uh, they did find that she was born free and she was, and was a free person and she had been unjustly transported uh, and therefore she was free to go, but she, had, but she did have to go immediately. Uh, so she was free, but she had to leave town. Uh, so they will be, the Columbus Library, uh, Columbus Lands Public Library System will be digitizing the record books after the case files. Unfortunately, not all of the record books have survived, but most of them did. Okay, so this is a little bit more about the criminal cases. These are the different kinds of criminal cases uh, that, um, 
that enslaved persons were mentioned in or were involved in. Uh, you can see there's all different kinds of things going on. Um, All right, and then uh, and there's also some examples of uh, free of free persons of color, uh, specifically this one uh, with Lucy Mills, known as uh, Free Lucy, who was accused of keeping a disorderly house in 1849, and you can see uh, they were what was determined that she was doing was allowing um, men and women of all races uh, to gather together at, at her house during the day and they were causing a ruckus. Uh, now, you can also see they had written, let me see if you can. Oops. Okay, over here, uh, I think, the whoring. Anyway, one of these, they had, they had written whoring and then crossed it out. So I guess there was some debate as to whether or not she was uh, allowing that to happen in her disorderly house. Okay, so moving on from the from the courts a little bit, we are now moving into things that um, that could have potentially, sort of in theory, have been used as evidence uh, if someone had wanted to to prove whether or not somebody was enslaved, uh, such as plantation records. Uh, so plantation records document the operations of a plantation, including journals uh, like plantation journals receipts and bills of sale. These are most often found as part of personal and family papers. Uh, this is an example of a plantation ledger page. This one is uh, from the University of Mississippi libraries. And uh, what it says at the top here is by payment through the hands of William Snodgrass in full, $16. And then this over here, these are the names of the enslaved persons. Um, so, th so this is, these are, just, this is just an example of the kinds of things you can find in plantation records. All right, so receipts and bills of sale. Uh, these are documents that can be found in probate files as well as in personal and family papers. And they document the transfer of an enslaved person from one enslaver to another. Uh, these, these can include the names of the buyer and the seller. Uh, the name, sometimes you get an age or you get a, a, an age descriptor such as old or young. Uh, of the enslaved person, the, the date and the location of the sale, and it may also include a physical description or family information, such as if you have, uh, you might say, a woman and her two children, something like that, or it may include a physical description of the enslaved person. Sometimes it will also include the home location of the buyer and the seller, uh, so you can sort of track the movement of the enslaved person. And uh, this is uh, an example from, uh, from Mississippi State University Libraries uh, for, uh, for a boy named Gabriel. And it was, it was again, a child. It was nine, nine or 10. Uh, and so this is another example of things to not do to your historic documents. As you can see, someone, again, tried to tape it back together. Please, we beg of you, do not do this. Uh, and so the... The, the part at the bottom here about warrant to be sound in both body and mind, that did actually have uh, legal weight. Um, there were also suits uh, from, uh, you know, from, from buyers and sellers who had, uh, if they had a, an enslaved person that they did not feel was sound, uh, then they would sue the person who had, uh, who, who had sold them, the, that person uh, to complain, basically. Okay. So now I'm going to show you how to search. So we're going to have a little bit of presentation inception here. All right, here's the Lantern Project. So this is our homepage. Um, and over here, you can see the, the, the list of events that we'll be doing. Uh, there are more of them. But to, if you want to search the records, you can click right here on search and browse available records. And this will bring you to our uh, collection homepage. And from here, you can either search, put in a search term, you can search the entire collection against across all of the institutions, or you can scroll down and you can uh, look at records from individual institutions. So um, I'm just gonna do historic matches. 
we've been talking a lot about probate records. Um, and so this is an example. All right. So when you get to this, right, and you're like, okay, I would like to see, I would like a better look at this document here. Do not click on this very tempting little thumbnail. Nothing will happen. See, nothing. You want to click on this, the title. And then you will get a PDF and you can scroll down and there it is. So here is what I was talking about. They say list of sales of the property of Robert Abrams deceased. And then they were sold by John Burney, his executor. And it was sold on the 15th of September of 1808. So it has the purchaser, which is John Comack. And then these are all of the property that he purchased. And then down here at the end, you will see that there is an enslaved man named Jack. Um, that was uh, part of that. Okay, so let's let's back up here. Uh, so you you've looked at this document and you've said, okay, uh, I'm interested in this document. If you want to, you can download it from from right there. Uh, but if you're not sure and you and you don't feel like waiting through the handwriting, we do have a a description, which is sort of a, a summary of it. There's a transcription, which this, this one is a, is a summary transcription, uh, but it does mention specifically um, the enslaved persons and, uh, and who, they will, who they were sold to. You can see the approximate creation date if you wanted to search for our, in the time period, if you wanted to search for uh, documents from this time period. Uh, and then down here is the really important part. So, uh, the source, where did this come from? It came from the Robert Abrams file, box one, probate and estate files collection, historic Natchez, Mississippi. The repository, historic Natchez. So, and then if you, uh, so if you need to know more information about this document or about this person or what else might be in this file, you want to contact historic Natchez. So here's the contact information. You can send them an email. And then if you want to, uh, to cite, this, if you're if you're writing a paper and you want to cite this, then here is the recommended citation. Okay. So let's you want to search for Harriet. If you want to search for a particular name, you can do that, and you can see that there are, are 37. Uh, records that include the name Harriet. Uh, some of them are from Montgomery County. Actually, most of them are from Montgomery County, but there's one from Historic Natchez. Uh, so you can see, let's click on that. Okay. All right, so this, what this is here is, this is the original envelope that, uh, that these records were contained in. And in this case, the Harriet is uh, the administrator of the estate. Okay. Let's do another search here. Okay. So if you wanted to, um, if you were interested in uh, enslaved persons in, involved in specific crimes, do that. All right, so you'll see there's a variety of documents, right? So first of all, these are from the University of Mississippi. Uh, they do have some, some transcribed news articles about enslaved persons involved in different crimes. Uh, so this one is from the New Orleans uh, B from 1842. Uh, but it doesn't, it doesn't, unfortunately does not, uh, does not name the enslaved person. Okay, and then this is a really interesting document. This, this lawyer's bill uh, from the Edward Ball estate, this, is, this, is, this one's from Montgomery. Um, so you can see here that it has received of uh, Mary Ball, who's the administrator 
of the of Edward Ball, Edward W. Ball deceased his estate, uh, and she and this person did pay ten dollars uh, to a lawyer for the defense uh, of an enslaved person for the murder of Edward W. Ball. Um, fortunately, I we don't know whatever happened with this case. That's probably something you would be able to find uh, in the uh, in the Montgomery County record somewhere. Um, but this is another, it's just another example of uh, the, un the unevenness in, of which uh, enslaved persons could be treated by the law. They would, you might find they would, they would hire a lawyer uh, to defend the person, but uh, there's a case in Columbus where um, they include the jury selection and I recognize the names and they're, they're white landowners. So they, they hired a lawyer to defend the enslaved person, but the jury is not of his peers, uh, it is of white landowners. All right, and then scrolling down, um, here's where you're going to get, uh, this is just an example of one of the court cases So, um, so these are all of the court documents in there. You can see them. Uh, this this man again has actually reason, reasonably nice handwriting. Okay, but here in the metadata they have they do have a description, and then they have a summary transcription of what this case is about. We're gonna go back here for a second. All right. Okay. So in the in the future, uh, we're hoping things will be fully transcribed and searchable, and we are going to be uh, uploading the information that we have recorded out of these documents, which has uh, has the information like the ages, locations, buyers, and sellers. Uh, of the enslaved persons that we were able to identify. Like I said, we will, we are still uploading documents and the, uh, the recorded information is going to be submitted to enslaved.org and the Digital Library of American Slavery. All right, and then some quick credits uh, slides that were used in this presentation were created by, uh, by me, um, as well as by Dee Dee Baldwin, History Research Librarian, at Mississippi State and by Mona Vance Ali. She's an archivist at Columbus Lounge Public Library. And again, a general reminder, if you have questions about specific items to contact the contributing institution. And if you have questions about the Lantern Project, you can, uh, you can contact me. Uh, and now I think we will open the floor for questions. I'm gonna stop sharing. All right. Thank you, Jennifer. That was really wonderful. Um, what an excellent introduction. I know uh, many people um, who will watch this will love to kind of get started and jump into this. Um, right now, I'm, I've invited people to post some questions in the chat. We'll see if we got any from our audience who's watching live. But if if a researcher, just to say not even a scholar, but just someone who's interested, a genealogist perhaps, or someone who just wants to get started, what would be your recommendation to them of how to even just kind of jump into a project like this? Well, okay. Um, what we tell anybody doing genealogy is start with yourself and work your way back. So write down um, everything that you know, right? Uh, you know, and if, what I tell people is if you have, if you have a narrative, create a tree. If you have a tree, write a narrative. Because when you reformat the data, that's when you start to see uh, the the holes and the things that don't make sense, and the and the and the and you start to say, okay, I need to find some documentary evidence for this um, to you know to make as much use of po potentially existing documentary evidence as you can for uh, for African Americans of course, getting, it's getting past the 1870 census, um, that can be the real challenge. But if you can get 
to the 1870 census uh, and you have sort of a rough idea, uh, or if you can, uh, have, have a rough idea of where those ancestors may have lived, um, which uh, if they, they were enslaved, uh, if they were not free people of color, if they were enslaved, which, uh, which families they may have been enslaved by, uh, then you can start looking for personal and family papers that may include plantation records or, or things like that. Or you could then start to, to think about looking at probate records. Now, um, Natchez well, had a high volume of the enslaved persons of Mississippi and, uh, and in a sort of, sort of global way where we're lucky because the Natchez courthouse never burned. This is not true everywhere in Mississippi. So there, there may be places where those, those probate records unfortunately did not make it. Um, so then you can, you can also look at, at Freedmen's Bureau records, which are available through the state archives, as well as through other, uh, other sites. Um, but yeah, that's, and, uh, and also if you have, if you have family narratives, if you have family histories, uh, those can sometimes, I mean, my family is full of wild stories. Uh, but they often contain a, a, a kernel or more of truth. So, uh, so if you can gather those and get as get get as many people to tell you the story as possible, because everyone will tell it differently, right? So, grandma may tell it one way, grandpa may tell it somewhere else, auntie auntie may tell it a third way, and there's going to be different pieces of information that you're gonna be able to sort of say, okay, everyone included this piece of information, right? But there might be different parts of the story that everybody tells differently. And in some cases, you're never gonna know the truth. And in some cases you might be able to say, okay, two people said this and one person said that. So let's try and prove either one or the other. Um, but yeah, that's, Sure. What, I, what, I, what I would tell somebody who's who's really like just starting out is to start with yourself, work your way backwards, gather as many as many facts as you can, as much as much information as you can, and then start sifting through it. And no matter how wild and how ridiculous the story is, don't discount it, but also don't cling to it, right? Um, I, I'm not going to get into my family stories, but uh, sometimes, like I said, there there is still there is still going to be a, a teeny tiny kernel of truth, and you just have to find it. Right. So, when it comes to the Lantern Project, what was the genesis for this, and how long have y'all been working on it? Uh, well, it's been about three years. We were the grant was awarded in 2019. And we were supposed to get started in 2020, and well, we all know what happened. Um, so, uh, when we first got sent home, we we're like, "Oh, now what?" Uh, but we said, "Well, we're going to get done what we can get done," and that's what we have worked under ever since. And we're in; we have, you know, powered through to the best of our ability. Uh, but really, uh, there were there was there were a number of different inspirations. Uh, and it was, and it was sort of a, a, a slow growth process that, uh, that I had, I learned about, uh, unknown no longer. I thought to myself, what do I have to do to do this at home? Uh, so I think I had, uh, I had discovered it doing, a assisting a patron with a reference question and who she was looking for, uh, her enslaved ancestors in Virginia. So I think I like, I think I Googled Virginia slave lists or something and it, it popped up and I was like, oh, um, and then I went to a, a conference presentation about it, and I thought, how do I do this? So I, uh, because I was processing collections at Mississippi State, I was sort of going, I set up an Excel file and said, okay, how much work is this really? Uh, and so I think I did about 13 collections worth. D well, Dee Dee was also helping with that at the time. Um, so between the two of us, we, we did about 13 collections, and then I 
knew that uh, that Mona Vance Ali had had just finished a sort of kind of a similar project in Columbus. I learned about a project that Dr. Hanbury was working on in Alabama because I went to a Society of Alabama Archivists conference. So the lesson here, go to your conferences. Um, <laughs> and so then I was at yet another conference and the, and it, the uh, representative from the NHPRC said that they were doing this, um, having this grant program for, uh, for early legal records and they were being very flexible about the concept of early, right? Because early is different for everybody. Uh, early in Massachusetts means one thing. Uh, early in Mississippi is, you know, 200 years later. So, um, so I, so we, I, we sent out an email. I shared the, uh, the the document, the Excel file that I had created to show people like exactly how much work this is, and we did, and we did choose Excel deliberately. Uh, because most people will have access to it and will have like even just a rough idea how to use it. And we were expecting that there would be different levels of um, technology availability at all these different kinds of institutions. So we didn't want to create a barrier to participation by saying you have to use this, you know, this fancy new program uh, where like pretty much everybody has Excel or Google worksheets. Um, you know, these, these are things that are frequently bundled with office or in the google worksheets they're they're for free because you can get them for free with the google account so uh so we sent out email um called some people to to uh to test the waters and uh we actually had a, we had a lot of pretty pretty solid response to the email and not everybody was able to, to participate in um in this in the grant funding uh, for a variety of reasons, we work on a kind of a tight schedule, but, and so we got, we kind of got our final crew together and we got through that grant funding process and here we are. <laughs> so. Well, um, it sounds like a who's who of the Society of Mississippi Archivists came together to pull, <laughs> pull, pull this wonderful project off. And let's just say it is American Archives Month. So happy yes. American Archives Month. Right. Um, I, we, I, I've just noticed that while we haven't had uh, any questions from our audience yet, we did have a note from Senator Hillman Frazier, um, who sends his kudos um, for the good work here. And we're so proud of Senator Frazier represents um, the uh, uh, where Jackson State is. Um, we are um, uh, in represented by Senator Frazier. And he's a longtime member of the Margaret Walker Center Board, and I know he appreciates this historical work and is a great supporter of the humanities in our state legislature. And so for those of us who are all at these public institutions, we're grateful for folks like Senator Frazier and what they do to enable us to do work, good work like this. Well, I'm going to, at this point, I think, without seeing any other questions, um, from the audience. We can wrap this up. Okay. Uh, Jennifer, thank you again for taking the time to do this. This will be available on the Margaret Walker Center Facebook and YouTube page. People will continue to be able to, to learn about this and hopefully engage the resources and, um, and, and we'll get people really learning about this uh, little touched part of Mississippi history. Just the access that you're providing it is really incredibly important. So thank you for this work and for everyone who was involved. Well, th thank you so much uh, for uh, for hosting me this evening. I really appreciate it. And uh, for those of you out there, if you have a question, but you don't want to ask it in, in front of uh, God and everybody, uh, you can uh, feel free to send me to uh, send an email and I will assist you as best I can. Well, Jennifer, if you don't mind, I will post your email address in the chat here is that yeah, okay that's fine. yeah that's fine let's add it here it's on it's on the mississippi state website so uh, <laughs> so it's out there it's there a you go um, well, and, and with our public employees so right uh, it, we've shared it there for the audience and um i, I really hope um that this is the beginning of a, just a remarkable project and and growth in this project because there's so much more uh, to do around this so Yes. Well, thank you again. Thanks, everyone, um, for watching. Well, thanks. And um, please join the Margaret Walker Center for our future programming. Check us out on Facebook, Instagram, 
Twitter, um, and you can uh, sign up for our listserv online as well. Good night, everybody. All right.